<laughs> okay, friends, this is different. Today, it's random thoughts. Whatever is going through Steve's head is going to come out in this video. It may not be pretty, but I hope it's interesting. That's what we're shooting for. And the first thing is a tip. It's a tip that you, you've probably already done, but I want you to do it consciously. And that is to listen in the dark. Turn off the lights and then shut your eyes so you're not seeing the lights on your amplifiers and stuff. Listen in total blackness. And what happens is really interesting. You, you, the sound changes when you don't have visual cues of looking at the speakers or looking at whatever. Listening in the dark lets you really hear the system. That's the value of it. And more important than hearing the system is hearing your music. You will feel differently about the music if you listen in dark, not multitasking, not thinking about what's for dinner or lunch. Just be one with the music. And the absolute best way to do that, which is free, <laughs> is listen in the dark. Okay, next thing in terms of random thoughts. I did think of these things before I turned on the camera. Whatever happened to high resolution music? I've been hearing about it for literally over 20 years. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And it does come, and it is here in dribs and drabs. But a lot of high resolution music, the, the higher resolution music, is old music, usually from analog sources, that is, you know, 9624 or 192 or something. Yeah, you know, reissues of classic rock or classic anything and remastering in high res. Yeah, that's that's always sort of been part of the high res story. I'm talking about new music from living bands who bring out their new record in high res. And I would say Steve's definition of high res has to be at least 8824. This 24-bit uh, uh, 44 1 or 24 bit uh, 48 eh, like it, it's sort of high res but it's half-assed high res there's no real belief in high res by record companies or musicians that there's a big enough market in there for them to be really serious about making high resolution recordings remember as I've said a billion times before most people are listening on earbuds and in their cars and noisy environments, blah, blah, blah. The benefits of high res are not really relevant in those situations. So that's the way everybody lives. It's the 99%. We're the 1%. The other 99% really don't care. I'm curious. I was thinking about subscribing to Amazon's new high res thing just to experience at least for a little while. And I'll get back to you on that if I actually do. I probably will. Just for the sake of having something to say about it that's meaningful by experiencing it. But, you know, high res from Cobas and Tidal, which I've listened to, eh, if it's a really good recording and it's in really well done in high res, it sounds good. But those are far and few between. So I'm not still not on board with this high res thing. What about you? Tell me about your experiences in high res in the comments section. And I could tag onto that the whole surround sound for music thing. Another thing that keeps being talked about in here and there, but never goes anywhere. And I'm not talking about movies or you know videos with visual information with surround. That's you know, that's been around forever. Movies have been in surround <laughs> since The Wizard of Oz. So no, <laughs> I'm talking about sound only surround recordings. Stephen Wilson, for his own group and his solo records, has made some really excellent surround recordings uh, of new music. Uh, and he's done remasterings and remixes of classic rock, you know, like Jethro Tull and stuff. Yeah, I'm talking about new music. So again, where is it? Show me the, show me the surround, please. I want to I wanna hear it, I want to experience it. I don't, actually. <laughs> I'm kidding, really. Because I don't have access to a surround system anymore, so it really wouldn't be for me. Then there's the subject of the room itself. Is the room sealed? In other words, if you're in a room with the windows are closed and the doors are closed, how does that affect the sound? How does it affect the bass being in this sealed, let's say, enclosure, the room itself, right? Um, 
What happens if you open the door? Better yet, if there's two doors to that room going in different directions. If you open both doors, if you open the windows. So now the room is no longer a sealed acoustic environment. It can breathe, it can, the sand can expand beyond the room. And of course, if the room isn't a strict rectangle and it opens up into halls and other spaces in a, in a house or an apartment, um, how does that change the sound? And I'll tell you, especially in the bass, um, it probably sounds better with everything open. But if you have that, if you can try that, if you can listen with everything open versus everything closed, doors and windows closed, I think it makes a difference. My room here uh, is a very unusual space. It's the furthest thing from a rectangle uh, and it's it's an open space, so I can't actually do that here. But I used to live in a, my listening room used to be a rectangular 11 by 18 foot room <clears throat> with two doors, one to the bathroom and one to the other room. And when I opened those doors, it did sound better. And windows. So again, more stuff for you to try. Now my friend Miguel, he suggested that if you have, let's say, bookshelf speakers or s smaller speakers uh, and you put uh, a weight, a flat weight on top of them, like a barbell weight or something. He, he mentioned like a 10 pound slab of steel. That'd be kind of hard to find, but let's say a barbell or something. Something that's heavy, that's not gonna interfere with the sound coming out of the speaker. Basically, weight the speaker down and that will change the resonance of the speaker. It will tighten up the enclosure and, and change the sound. Better? Probably. Worse? Possibly. Uh, again, it's an experiment worth trying, putting a weight on top of a speaker. See what happens. Okay, so if you have your components, your preamplifier, CD player, DAC or something, just sitting naked on their feet that are on the bottom of the chassis, that can sound good, right? Okay. But you can change the sound a little bit, or more than a little bit, if you put it on top of, let's say, some kind of pointy foot like this, right? I've had this forever. I have no idea what it's called. But sometimes they're metal. This is some kind of machine plastic. But a pointy foot, that's one kind of sound. Then there's this. This is a squishy, mushy thing. It's, I think it's made out of sorbethane. Uh, this one's made by AudioQuest. They probably still make it. That's option number two. And then there's this. This is an air um, block. It's a chunk of wood, just a rectangular piece of wood. Uh, that's interesting too. They, they all have a sound signature. Uh, I think the, the pointy foot uh, accentuates detail. The mushy one kind of softens details, that kind of thing. The wood, I think, in some ways is the most neutral. It sounds better than the feet usually on a component. Uh, but you don't, you don't have to buy a fancy air one. You could just use a piece of wood, <laughs> hard wood, in a, in a block form to sort of do the same thing. Then there's ones with springs, all kinds of stuff that you can, footers that you can put your components on. Now, I've, I've experimented in the past with using marbles. Now, marbles, or better yet, like steel balls, are really interesting because when done correctly, with some risk, as I'll tell you about in a second, you put, put let's say, three underneath a preamplifier, and now it's going to glide around and move on these um, marbles or steel balls. And uh, that seems to just bring up low-level detail. You just hear more into the music. The catch with it is it's sort of dangerous because it can, your preamplifier whatever, can roll off the balls or the marbles or whatever. So you got to do it with some caution. Usually the cables connected to it sort of stabilize it to some degree. But experimenting with marbles um, or any spherical piece that you can put under uh, a component. If you're a, an audiophile, uh, I'll try that kind of person, do it. And if you've already done these things, listening in the dark, a high res, etc., please comment below. So I think we've done it. My name is Steve Guttenberg. 
This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. Right now, it's coming to you five times a week. It could change. We'll see how it goes. Right now, I'm settling on a five-day-a-week schedule, um, usually on the weekends every day. We'll see. It's, it's, it's open. It's, a, it's, it's movable. It's a movable feast. Uh, oh, there's more. You should check out the playlist on this channel. There's playlists for music reviews and headphone reviews and speaker reviews and amplifier reviews and interviews. God, there's like 80 or 90 interviews on the channel. Really good stuff. Um, and uh, now I'm now I'm done. I'm done for good. This is the Audiophiliac. And now I really am done. So as always, thank you so much for watching. And I hope to see you back here again very, very soon.